Hello everyone, I'm Sean Hyder and I'm one of the ITU registrars. And this session is really to go through acute liver failure. So what are the objectives of this session? It is define and describe the etiology of acute liver failure, explain the physiology and the management of it, and describe the criteria for referral. So it's defined as an abrupt loss of hepatic and metabolic and synthetic function. It leads to an encephalopathy and potentially multi-organ failure. It's seen by an absence of chronic liver disease, an acute hepatitis with raised transaminase and a coagulopathy with an INR of greater than 1.5, any degree of mental alteration, which is known as encephalopathy, metabolic derangement, including hypoglycemia and lactic acidosis, and the illness is often less than 26 weeks duration. So there is a common ALF classification, which is divided into three areas. And this basically defi is defined as the speed of onset of encephalopathy from the time the patient becomes symp symptomatic. So it can either be hypoacute with an onset of less than one week, this is commonly seen in paracetamol toxicity. Acute with an onset of 8 to 28 days, usually seen in patient uh, viral cases. And subacute, 29 days to 12 weeks. And this can be drug related, which we'll talk about later on. The conservative management survival rate is of between 10 and 40% in these patients. So what are the causes of acute liver failure? This is fairly important because it depends on the cause, depends on how you're going to manage the patient as it can vary. So in Britain, the most common cause is paracetamol toxicity, so drugs. But there are other drugs that can cause acute liver failure, things like rifampicin, isoniazide, sodium valproate, for example, as well as the others described here. Viral causes of acute liver failure are amongst the most common cause worldwide of acute liver failure. Vascular causes such as Bud Chiari syndrome or ischemic causes, infiltrative ones such as lymphoma, melanoma and TB, as well as the autoimmune condition. Pregnancy such as help and fatty liver can also cause acute liver failure, as well as metabolic things such as Wilson's disease. So how do you manage, or how do you investigate, first of all? So it's important to do blood tests. So simple blood tan, blood, uh, routine blood tests are important, like full blood count, use an ease to check the kidney function, um, LFTs to check the transaminase levels as well. And you can get a coagulopathy as well in acute liver failure, as well as a metabolic acidosis, which you'll see in the ABGs. It's important to check the ammonia levels, as well as ceruloplasmin, particularly if the patient's got Wilson's disease. And there's also uh, autoimmune screens, such as ANA, anti-smooth muscle antibodies. A pregnancy test is also important if you're concerned that the patient may well be pregnant and is suffering from help, for example. Paracetamol and salicylate levels are very, very important as you can treat the patient with N-acetylcysteine very easily. And it's also important you check the amylase levels. A viral screen, including a hepatitis serology and HIV antibodies, is also important. Radiological testing that you can do can include a liver Doppler ultrasound, and that's to check the patent field of hepatic veins, to check that the patient doesn't have blood Chiari syndrome, for example. So how do you manage these patients? So we'll go through the system. So neurologically, what happens? So normally the liver is very important in breaking down ammonia into urea. But because there's liver dysfunction in the Kufner cells, ammonia cannot be broken down to urea. And what happens is glutamine synthase breaks down ammonia into glutamine. And that builds up in the cerebral astrocytes. And that can lead to increase in uh, intracerebral swelling and edema. So how do we protect the brain from any secondary injury? It's important to elevate the head to 30 degrees to ensure appropriate cerebral perfusion pressure. 
Good sedation as well, or to limit the intracerebral pressure. Avoiding hypertension, prevent hypoxemia, and maintain a low to normal range of the PaCO2 between 4.7 to 5.2 kilopascals. Good tight glycemic control is crucial between 4 and 10 millimoles per litre. And if you're concerned about raised intracerebral pressure, you can give the patient either mannitol or hypertonic saline. It is important when you're giving the patient mannitol that you're not giving it to a patient who's oliguric, for example, who's not on CVVH, as this can worsen their uh, renal function. Hepatic encephalopathy is broken down into four grades. Grade 1, 2, 3 and 4, as you can see here on this slide. Grade 3 and 4 is what we're concerned about as anaesthetists, and they're the ones that require intubation and ventilation. So the respiratory system. Airway protection, like I've mentioned, in grade 3 and 4 is crucial. Compromised resp respiratory function can occur due to intra-abdominal hypertension caused by ascites, ascites sorry, pleural effusion, acute liver injury, and ARDS. There is a risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia in these mechanically ventilated patients, and that's because of the diminished immune response caused by liver failure when you have an acute phase and complement response. Also, because patients are often heavily sedated, they can have a reduced bronchial suction, which makes them more prone to getting uh, a VAC. It is important that you avoid PEEP, and this can increase intracerebral pressure and hepatic venous pressure. The cardiovascular system. So fluid is a tricky uh, topic for these patients. They're often IV depleted, secondary to insensible losses, vomiting, reduced oral intake. And they do have a reduced uh, systemic vascular resistance, which can cause a hepatic hypoperfusion. They also have a poor lactate clearance because of the liver dysfunction. So it's important to give a cautious um, IV fluid as it can worsen cerebral edema. I would avoid things like 5% uh, dextrose because not only can it cause a hyponatremia, but it can also worsen the cerebral edema. If concerned about hypertension, you can start the patient on vasopressors such as noradrenaline or vasopressin. This will limit the amount of IV fluids you need to give to the patient to maintain a good MAP. The other thing about vasopressors is if the patient is not responding to uh, your vasopressor, you may like to consider a short Sinaxin test. The patient have, may have adrenal insufficiency and require some hydrocortisone IV. Hepatorenal syndrome. Because there's a buildup of uh, endotoxins in the patient's body, this can result in a rise in cardiac output and drop in systemic vascular resistance, resulting in a renal hypoperfusion. This then leads to hepatorenal syndrome, which can be seen by reduced GFR and sodium excretion. This, can, this is irreversible and can result in uh, multi organ failure. So it's really important to keep an eye on the kidney. Acute kidney injury can be secondary to paracetamol overdose and nephrotoxic drugs. So it's important you cross those off the uh, drug chart, as well as checking uh, the paracetamol levels. Remember, N-acetylcysteine is such a simple drug to give and can avoid all of these uh, detrimental uh, effects of liver dysfunction. You can, if AKI becomes worse, you can always put the patient on CVVA HDF, particularly if there's signs of fluid overload on these patients and metabolic and worsening metabolic acid. Nutrition. Acute liver failure is a catabolic state, so it's imp important that these patients receive either enteral or parenteral feeding. Protein intake should not be restricted as you can have a reduced protein binding and um, reduced metabolism. Laxatives are important to remove nitrogenous waste. 
and 10% dextrose can be given because there's a reduction in hepatic glycogen stores, gluconeogenesis, and a hyperinsulinemia. But again, be cautious, I'll be cautious about dextrose because it can result in a worsening soluble edema. A PPI can also be given to reduce the risk of GI bleed because of coagulopathy, which we'll talk about now. But first of all, infection. Antibiotics are not given routinely. They're used if there's a high index of suspicion, and liver transplant patients will be given prophylactic antibiotics. Things like tazacin can cover both gram-positive, which is um, Staph aureus, and gram-negative, which is E. coli. Other things are given are fluconazole for fungal infections like Ascamza. There is a risk of DIC. The liver synthesizes all clotting factors except factor VIII, and also acute liver failure can result in reduction of antithrombin 3 and protein C, which can push a patient into DIC. You mustn't give SSP routinely because of the risk of overloading the patient. It also masks trends of PTT, which are important for the, uh, as a prognostic indicator in acute liver failure. Use of NAC early uh, is important until the INR is less than 2. So what's the criteria of referral? So basically, if encephalopathy uh, remains present despite your efforts to manage the patient, and INR is worsening with a worsening creatinine level, and the metabolic acidosis is still less than 7.3 with hypoglycemia, it warrants you to pick up the phone and speak to the liver unit. Like I've said, patients who are, have acute liver failure, um, if there's a cause which is not related to paracetamol toxicity and they're not encephalopathic, you must refer them to um, the liver failure unit as these patients can, can decline rapidly. Liver transplantation in the UK, there's about 600 to 700 transplants a year. Acute liver failure is a rare indication of only 10% of all liver transplant cases. However, it is uh, contraindicated in these four forms. If there's irreversible brain damage, accelerated inotrope requirement, uncontrolled sepsis, and with severe respiratory failure. The King's College Hospital criteria for liver transplantation for those with paracetamol overdose is when there's a pH of less than 7.3, irrespective of whether they have encephalopathy, or all of the following. So either a, so all of grade 3 or 4 encephalopathy, a creatinine of more than 300, or a PTT of more than 100 seconds. If the cause is non-paracetamol induced, then the criteria is different. If the prothrombin time is more than 100 seconds, or any three of the following, and that includes unfavorable etiology, jaundice of more than seven days before encephalopathy, and an age of less than 10 or more than 40 years old. So the key points. It's complex. It's not an easy thing to manage. But it's important to know what the underlying cause is in order to manage these patients effectively. It's important to recognize acute liver failure it's also important to treat with N-acetylcysteine, which has an important role of management, even if you're unsure whether the patient has paracetamol toxicity, give it sooner rather than later. Early involvement of the liver ICU specialist is vitally important in the management of acute liver failure. So the objectives of this session were to define and describe the etiology of acute liver failure, explain the physiology and management, and this prescribe the criteria for referral. So a few questions just to finish off. Concerning liver failure, paracetamol toxicity is the commonest cause of acute liver failure worldwide. That's false because we know it's viral. Hyperacute presentations of acute liver failure are associated with poorer outcomes. Again, that's false because it's subacute. Albumin is a good marker of acute liver failure. The half-life of albumin is 20 days, so it's a poor marker. 
and all patients with acute liver failure should receive prophylactic antibiotics. Again, that's false. The following are poor prognostic markers of acute liver failure. A prothrombin time of more than 100 seconds, that's true. Elevated serum ammonia levels, that's true. Underlying etiology of paracetamol toxicity, that's false. Poor prognostic markers are hidden etiology of viral disease. Prolonged period between the onset of jaundice and encephalopathy. That's true, because that, de because that describes the subacute presentation. The following are diagnostic criteria for acute liver failure. Absence of chronic liver disease, true. Acute, tran acute transaminitis, also true. Coagulopathy with an INR of 1.3, that's false because you want an INR of more than 1.5. Evidence of encephalopathy, that's true. And an illness duration of less than 28 days. That's false because a subacute presentation can be more than 28 days. And concerning the management of neurological complications, the target PACO2 is the low to normal range. That's true. Hypertonic saline is a recognised treatment of cerebral edema. Again, true, as is mannitol. All patients should have invasive intracranial pressure monitoring. That's false because you have to be concerned about patients who are coagulopathic. Sedation and ventilation is recommended for Graves' disease, encephalopathy and above. That's true. Thank you very much.